So tonight I wanted to uh, start by telling you about a comment that my first teacher, a Zen teacher, many years ago, made about me. And he told me way back then at the beginning, he said that my mind was like a squirrel's tail. I thought, hmm, this doesn't sound so great, you know. But, you know, you don't ask, you didn't ask him. First of all, it was very Zen style. It's a little like ep- epigrammatic. You know, you don't really ask. You're supposed to figure it out yourself. So um, I thought about it. And being my mind, the first thing I went to, okay, he means something good. You know, this is the way my mind works. Let me think of something good. Well, a squirrel's tail is bushy. Well, that's nice. You know, it's pretty. And I thought a bushy mind just didn't make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> it's like, so if it's not bushy, what's that? Well, a squirrel's tail is graceful, yes. I like that one, too. But that just didn't seem to be what he was saying either. So I was looking more and more furry, you know, definitely not. Uh, so I started to ponder about this, and I started watching squirrels' tails. <laughs> it helped. And I noticed that when squirrels are irritated or when they're afraid, their tails are going like this. You never notice that? It's flickering all over the place. And I knew. <laughs> this was it. It was a mind that was flickering all over the place. So, of course, um, I made an inner determination. You know, I, I didn't talk to him about it. And let me say, because he was a Zen master, you know, and also he was Korean and didn't speak English very well. And that actually enhanced his position as far as we were concerned. You know, we were pretty starry eyed. And so it meant that anything he said, you know, and particularly if I couldn't understand it a lot, it meant that it, this was profound. You know? So I decided within myself, you know, without really consulting him, that um, I was just going to get rid of that squirrel's tail mind. I was going to get a quiet mind. And uh, since then, I have to say a lot of time has passed, a good deal of time has passed, and I've done a lot of huffing and puffing, spiritually speaking. I've done a lot of efforting. Um, and certainly I don't want to build this up. There are a lot of people who have done more than I have. But you know, I've spent time in the Zen tradition, and I have worked with koans, which are the kind of Zen riddles which don't have a logical answer. You've got to snap into another level of answer. I've worked with shikantaza, which is working really being with pure awareness. It's a meditation with pure awareness. I've worked in our, our tradition, the Theravada tradition, as we all have, who've been here for any length of time, with uh, mindfulness, loving kindness, and I've also some, done some work with the meditative absorptions. Also in some other traditions, I've done some work. I've lived in a couple of monasteries. It sounds pretty good, right? Well, I will tell you, after all this time, my mind is still like a squirrel's tail. <laughs> it still is. What does that mean? Well, we call it in our tradition, papancha. That is a proliferating mind, the mind that runs on. And we all, all know just what papancha is, the mind that runs on thoughts, and we get captured by them. Um, Now, I need to always say, just to be fair to me, it wasn't always like a squirrel's tail. That's really true. You know, particularly when I'm doing retreats and longer retreats, the mind comes down and it gets quieter. Um, Sometimes in meditation, it doesn't have to be a long retreat, and sometimes in daily life. But the squirrel's tail is still very much in presence, and I would be um, not saying the truth if, if I didn't say that. But some things have changed over the years, and that's what I want to talk about tonight and build this talk around that, about what's changed over the years. So I've been calling this talk in my own mind, The Squirrel's Tail and Pure Awareness. Squirrel's Tail and Pure Awareness. I think all of us, as meditators, you know, we, we long for a quiet mind. We hear a lot about it. We lust after a quiet mind. It is built up as what it is uh, that we are, quite unquote, going for. And I think we commonly think that a quiet mind means a, a mind where no thoughts are happening. You know, and if we've ever tried to squeeze thoughts out of the mind, you know that this is a pretty futile business. Um, now, first of all, I want to assume that there are and have been individuals who do have a supremely quiet mind, that their minds are quiet except when working, when thoughts need to occur, when thoughts need to arise, the thoughts arise, they think what they need to think, 
and the mind is quiet again, just like a little stone that ripples in the pond and when, then is quiet again. This is a supreme level of attainment. And in the Mahayana tradition, and like the Buddha, I think we can assume that the Buddha had such a level of attainment, and there have been others. It doesn't have to be only in the Buddhist tradition. In the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, they call that level of attain- attainment Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. I love that kind of phrase. You know, it's so obscure <laughs> what it might mean. It means supreme enlightenment. And it's said that the Buddha had Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. But for most of us, this is far from the case, right? For most of us, I think our minds are more like uh, an airport terminal. You know, it's just all kinds of stuff going on all the time. And then as we are all learning about what goes on in the brain, I came across some statistics about all those firing neurons and the synapses. There are 100 billion, I'll read some statistics, 100 billion neurons in the brain. And each has about 1,000 connections. So that's 100 trillion in all. 100 trillion neurons in all, each person's mind. And the synapses fire from one to a hundred times a second. So it's quadrillions of synapses activating per minute. And the possibilities of the number of brain states, well, somebody computed this, and they said the number of possible brain states that human beings can experience, and that includes emotional states too, it's not just thoughts, but the various shades of brain states is one followed by a million zeros. One followed, I mean, it's so big, I think it's hard to just, you know, comprehend, except that it's huge. So what does a quiet mind mean uh, in that context? So we're going to be talking about this a bit tonight. And I'd like to say with all of that, this one followed by a million zeros, number of possible brain states. You know, as we go through our daily life, we experience many, many, many. How can it be otherwise? Someone once said that our minds are like tofu. They take the flavor of the environment that they're in. So if you're in the middle of daily life and there's a lot of stress in your daily life, well, your tofu mind is going to pick up on it, right? It does that. It's not unnatural. It's going to do that. And not to be totally heretical, but I suspect that even if, um, say, the Buddha, who... If, if he had had with him his wife Yasodhara and his son Rahula, and if they had come to live with him, and they, he had had all the conditions and the uh, challenges that we have in daily life with regard to what? Insurances, cars, Comcast, you name it, we have it. You know, maybe he would get caught up in some of these mind states. He would experience some of these mind states too. The question is, would he get caught in them? Surely the mind in that environment experiences them. Does he get caught? I'm not going to try to answer it because who knows? And, you know, we'd hope that he wouldn't and that the other great masters don't. But that's not where I'm going because I'm really going to focus more on my experience and what I know, which I have a feeling is closer to what you know as well. And something important that I have realized over the years is that it's not the point whether the mind is like a squirrel's tail or not. That's not the point. The point is, do we identify with the squirrel's tail mind, with all those thoughts that are rippling through or the synapses? Do we identify with them? Do we buy into our thoughts? And I can say with some honesty that increasingly I'm less and less buying in to the thoughts as they occur as defining who I am, the me and the mine. And when I do buy in, I'm finding that more readily over the time as this practice occurs, more readily um, I can begin to notice, oh, hey, I bought in, you know, and not only notice, but laugh. This is where mindfulness, the power of this wonderful practice comes up. We notice when we have bought in, oh, I'm being carried off by it. It isn't in itself a problem. It's just about noticing it. That's the process. And then just kindly, with kindness, oh, pulling out in the moment. Maybe being kind to yourself. I tend to really have developed a practice of talking to myself. 
something like, okay, sweetheart, it's okay. You know, you really got into that one, didn't you? Or you really made a mess. This is not right speech. You ever gotten not right speech? This was not right speech. Okay, honey. You know, that just happens. Sometimes we do that. It's not right speech. I'm going to try to do better, but not to get clutched up on it. Like, oh, how could I do this? And, you know, leave it to me to do something like that. We all have heard that kind of statement, maybe from ourselves. Even if you get into a leave it to me to do something like that kind of statement, notice, ah, there I am. You know, the little ego is talking again and blaming again. That's okay. Pulling out, pulling out, pulling out. You know, so that really means no longer believing your thoughts, that they're reality. I think we've all heard Sharon or Pat or I or Jackie or others who have come up here, the story about the Buddha. On the night of his enlightenment, according to the texts, he was challenged by Mara, which is illusion. And we can, don't have to take Mara as a real physical being, but the idea of illusion. And Mara brought up to him certain, oh, tantalizing prospects, you know, and certain ideas like, oh, if he were not enlightened, then, you know, he, or if he were to forswear the idea of being enlightened, he could have all the power in the world he wanted. And there were other things, too. And each time that Mara brought this up, the Buddha said, I know you, Mara. That's what is happening every time we make this gesture to pull out of the thoughts that have grabbed us and want to tell us that they are who we are. They're reality and they've got to be believed as who we are and defining us. When we know better, we're saying, I know you, Mara. I know you, Mara. Thinking is going to happen. The synapses are going to fire. But as we practice, we increasingly realize that there is a gap between the content of the thought and the process of thinking. Do you hear that? A gap between the content of what we're thinking and the process of thinking. This is what we increasingly begin to realize. We've often quoted here, you know, that neat little bumper sticker, don't believe everything you think. We've all heard that one. This is what it's referring to. And in fact, I think as I've said once or twice before, you could even say, don't believe anything you think. And that sounds radical. But on the level in which I'm speaking, it has a different meaning. I'm not talking about the content of the thoughts. Of course we've got to think. Of course we've got to get through life. And of course we need to do that. But we don't have to get caught up as, hey, this is who I am. You know, I'm, and then we've got all our stories about who we are. Don't believe anything you think. Don't identify and get caught up with it. Pull out and notice, oh, thinking is happening. Don't get so personal about it. it happens to every one of us, thinking. It's the nature of the human mind. This is not dissociation. This is not trying to get away from our suffering. This is, in fact, simply receptivity. Being receptive to whatever is being thought, because thoughts come up on the pri- uh, due to our prior causes and conditions, as they always say in the text, prior causes and conditions. Whatever the causes and conditions you're, uh, in your life, you're going to have certain kinds of thoughts, and not all of them are you going to go like. Some of them are going to be some things you don't like whatsoever. What do we do about it? We notice. We're kind. We pull out and recognize this doesn't define me. This is not who, at the deepest level, I truly am. At a deeper level, what we simply do is we, diso- we disidentify from the, process, from the content of the thoughts. We embrace it in a way. We are present. And here's where I'd like to shift perspective in this little talk right now. I'm talking on our everyday level, and I'm going to shift perspective here and say, over the years, here's what I have found, and I believe this is pretty true in terms of our our practice. Over the years, I think we could say that the energy center shifts, begins to shift. The energy center begins to shift so that increasingly we are grounded more and more in the awareness Call it a pure awareness, an open awareness. Call it presence. Some people have called it Buddha nature, cosmic consciousness. It sounds so big, these terms. They're not. It's the closest thing to you. 
We all know it, even on a deep level, and we long for it. Our heart knows it, even if our mind has a hard time getting around it, and the mind does have a hard time getting around it, simply because it's not on the level of thinking. Increasingly, we recognize, we know, that our thoughts, in fact, just come up, bubble up from this place of awareness. How else could it be? Bubbling up from just this place of presence. It's like what I said earlier in the evening. I was suggesting that when you were meditating, you notice that space in between the inhale and the exhale and the exhale and the inhale, where if your mind wasn't caught up in wall-to-wall thinking at that moment, nothing happens. It's just presence. You're there. There's a presence there. That's awareness. How simple. How really simple to talk about this in a different way. I was recently on a, doing a self-retreat in California at a beautiful little Zen center called Sonoma Mountain Zen Center in, uh, outside of Santa Rosa. And um, the architecture and some of the buildings there was just exquisite. It was built in sh- traditional Japanese style. They had both a zendo, that's the place where everyone meditates, and also what I can only call a bathhouse. I don't want to call it a bathroom. Totally gives you the wrong idea. There were there were were toilets there, there were the basins there, there were the showers there. It was built in traditional Japanese style in the sense that it was all wood. It was wood beams, a, a wood structure with beautiful white paneling, immaculate extremely beautifully designed. The women's side was on one side and the wall between and then the men's side on the other side. And just truly exquisite. So I walked in there the first day and the first thing that has struck me aside from the beauty, which I happen to particularly like, this Japanese style of that style, the first thing I saw when you walk in is a sign about mm, this big. It says, no trace. That's about it. One sign, no trace. And I thought, this is really interesting. You know, I've been to several centers, and some of you have. Signs all over the place about all kinds of procedures, what to do, what not to do. I've lived at uh, Bhavana Society, which some of you have been to also, a monastery in West Virginia. Um, signs everywhere, of, in all sorts of stages of decomposition, I might add. And I have been responsible for some of them. It's, I'm kind of interested when I go to Bhavana because I've generated some of them. And so I know this kind of this history. It's always, always like, like an archaeological dig. You know, the signs that were there before I was there, the ones that I generated, and that those are that have come after. And you can see the fingerprints and some are frilly at the edges. And here I walked into this, Zen, this bathhouse in Sonoma Mountain, the Zen Center. No trace. This is a radical teaching. No trace. In our society, which of course is devoted to accumulating and leaving as many traces as possible, right? From trinkets to trash, everywhere, no trace. So on the first level, what does no trace mean? Well, obviously, in the context of the bathhouse, it meant, please keep it clean. And by golly, they did. You know, just clean surfaces. And there wasn't a litter. I was thinking about, well, I won't call it litter, but at Bhavana Society, in the women's main bathhouse, clocks, most of which don't work everywhere, soap, little bottles, little bars that are used, little signs and so forth. Here was this incredibly gorgeous kind of granite surface. And these uh, just, well, I won't go into it. I can wax eloquent about Japanese architecture. But at any rate, no trace. So it was obviously, let's keep this clean. And people did. And in Zen, when people keep it clean, I mean, they're really, if you know anything about Zen, it's really clean. So that's on one level, of course. Keep the place clean. But no trace has a deeper, deeper meaning than that. More deeply, no trace refers to the mind. It's a teaching that refers to the mind. It refers to open awareness, or to the heart mind, as it's often called, citta. Not to the organ of the brain, but to that place of simply open awareness, which is understood as being just our natural state. When our mind is not being cluttered with the, or being, um, when the, let's say, the synapses aren't firing wildly, there's simply This natural state, openness, presence. Like birds flying through the sky is what our natural mind is. When birds fly through the sky, 
they are there, they pass. The sky doesn't accept or reject, it accepts all, it doesn't reject. and say, that bird can fly, but that one isn't going to get into my sky, my space. No, it all, they fly, birds fly through it. Same way, the no trace, the open awareness of the mind, simply allowing the thoughts to pass through and not attaching to it, not attaching to it. That means, if we go back to a squirrel's tail, that, hey, it's no problem if your mind is like a squirrel's tail. You know, if your mind is doing a squirrel's tail thing, no problem. Just notice. Not attaching, not building stories on it. Let it come, letting it go. So from the point of view of the heart mind, of the citta, our pure awareness, a squirrel's tail mind isn't a problem. From a point of view of the ordinary average person, particularly one who is not in touch or has, isn't aware of this training, it's a huge problem, the squirrel's tail mind. It grips us, and I'm talking about the emotions as well. It grips us, we think that that's us. It's our problem. It's our dilemma. And of course, on one level it is. Let me point that out. But there is a deeper level and understanding when, hey, this is just what happens to all human beings. Different versions different versions, but this is human. It's what it means to be a human being. Oh, problems come up. Thoughts come up. They grab us. Or we have the choice to pull out. So from the point of view of the average person who doesn't know this training, doesn't know about pulling out, about mindfulness, about letting go of the thoughts, squirrel's tail mind's a big problem. From a point of view of a meditator, is practicing mindfulness, that isn't such a problem. I love the word in uh, Pali for the average untrained person, or some rather pejorative terms that are used in the text. They call the person who has an untrained mind a patujana. I love the sound of that word. It's like you spit it out. Patujana means at the average untrained, un- world, the worldling, the untrained mind. But of course, also, the understanding is everyone has the choice. It's your choice. If you want to get out of that and begin to train your mind and also to learn what it means to begin to let go of suffering, then you begin to practice. You practice. So what I'd like to do right now is a short exercise with everyone. I'd like to invite you, if you wish, to simply... Sit for a moment in meditation. Just for a moment, we're going to be doing this. And I'm going to invite you to consciously make an effort to allow thoughts to rest in just the space between thoughts, to allow thoughts to just rest, if you can. We're going to do this for maybe one, one and a half minutes here. No thoughts. See if you can find a place where it's just not wall-to-wall thinking, but just letting go, even for an instant. And when thoughts come back, let them go again. Let me ask you now, just coming back, if you will. This doesn't have to be a deep, heavy kind of exercise. Was there anyone here who was successful, even for an instant, in resting in a place where there was no thought? Good. Let me ask, what was that like? How would you describe that experience? Remind me, Alana? It's like, uh, quietness. 
Yeah. Yeah. It was quietness. Thank you, Elena. Who else? What was this like? This moment, even if it was a fleeting instant, which there was no thought. Anyone else? A lot of people had their hands raised. Susan. Spaciousness. Good. Who else? I saw lots of hands up. Dale. Uh, utterly relaxation. So those of you who've raised who did experience it, yeah. Gray and black. Yeah. Okay. Gray and black. Yeah. Nothing much happening. Rick. Yeah. Right. Do you see how close it is? How very, very close it is to us. It's not something that you have to um, be blissed out. In fact, this isn't wasn't blissed out, was it? Susan, was that blissed out for you? No, it's not blissing out. It's so quiet. It's called the natural mind. In Zen, they talk about it as our natural mind. It's a very natural state. Was there a sense of self there in the instant you were experiencing it? Were you noticing, oh, well, you know, boy, I'm thinking this now. Was there a sense of self there in that moment when you were experiencing that kind of natural state? Okay. Anyone else? Right. There. Right. Yeah. There. Yeah. Very fine distinction. You know, in the moment of, there's just being, there's just presence. Yeah. And then the moment after, we think, whoa, wow, this was presence. This was terrific. Isn't that interesting? Remember that teaching that we've talked about so many times about selflessness, and then we all say, what does that mean, selflessness? Right there. That's it. So simple. So quiet. So what might this mean, this um, awareness for our daily life, in terms of daily life? What bearing might it have? What's the point? You know, why are we sitting here even talking about it? Is this just something esoteric? Susan. Yeah. Here's what I'm going to invite. Yeah, Alana, did you have a comment to make? Yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to invite every one of you then. Relax into this sometimes during the day. You know, it doesn't have to be a really, really difficult thing. It can be a very quiet little thing, just a few minutes. Sit down and just find that place, if you can. That place of just awareness. It's just awareness. Rick. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, you know, one of the... Yeah. 
Yeah. Wonderful. So just, yeah, just, oh, this is the invitation then. Just see if you can relax into that during the day. Now, of course, and this is the big one, it's hard for us to hold it. You know, this is not something that we can just maintain or stabilize in. Our mind flips back. Over time, as we practice more and more, the hope is that we can stabilize in it more often for a longer period of time. Not to worry. Each one of us is where we are. You are where you are in your practice. Just be where you are. What I have found over the years is that this being human is really like a dance. That's a dance that's occurring between the human nature that we have, our human nature, and all of its um, abundance and complexity, and a dance with pure awareness. And there's no conflict unless we want to make it. The mind is always going to want to find a conflict, but there really isn't a conflict. It's the squirrel's tail doing its thing, and that is involving both our emotions and our thoughts, and it's pure awareness, all of it. In Zen, they say not two, not one. They're they're not the same, and they're not different. That's a strange statement, but Zen is full of strange statements, and the reason why is because you can't grasp it with your mind. It's just like this moment of pure awareness is not something you can think about. The moment you're thinking about it, you're out of it, you see. This is just the dilemma. So there we are with this dance back and forth into our humanity with as much love, as much understanding, as much determination to be loving and skillful to ourselves and others as we can. And at the same time, recognizing that all is held and embraced with this pure awareness. Just this pure awareness. And so finally, I think this is what the middle way is. In the Buddhist traditions, often spoken of as the middle way. And I think this is it, this balance between our humanity and that which we represent, our our embodiments of, which is universal. Awareness. So I hope that this makes some sense. And I would like to open for questions if you have any. Yes, Dale. I have so much of questions. Comments. Yeah, please. Uh, that I know that for a long time, I always thought that this thoughtless state uh, was blank. But actually, that aware state is, I mean, there's a certain awareness that is there, and it doesn't mean that uh, our senses retreat. Well, I suppose at a very deep state of meditation, our senses retreat to uh, nothing. But but, uh, it's very possible to have, you know, to be sensing, to be aware without the, and then notice uh, without the discursive thinking. And uh, I think it took me quite a long time to sort of give up this sort of thought that thoughtlessness or uh, spaciousness has, is void of anything. Thank you. Right. And Dale has just finished a three-month retreat in which he was really focusing on awareness in just this way. And the truth is, is that the mind does not have... Much can happen in pure awareness or at various levels of awareness. And in fact, you can be and come from that place of awareness and thoughts can arise or sensing can arise and then leave. It's when you start holding on that you're out of it. You're out of it. You're back into your normal, everyday mind. That's why I said the squirrel's tail and pure awareness don't have to be in opposition to each other. The problem arises when we grab on and we identify with what's happening and we fall out of that pure awareness. It's not a problem otherwise. Yeah, Uriah. I know that Jean Paul Stott talks something about the image of imagination. What I wanted to ask you is that when you think of an image, Thought, in terms of 
Please, uh, would you express more what you mean by the image of thought? Can you give a concrete example? Like what? Let's say I am imagining that I'm going to Grand Canyon. And that there are certain experiences I'm going to have because of what's in that environment. But the image of that is not what I am seeing in terms of what I'm going to be, hopefully, that I'm going to experience. So the image of it, I'm still not clear about what is the image of it then in your mind. I know it's different from the imagination of what I'm imagining. Is the image like pictures you've seen of the Grand Canyon as opposed to the story about what you might be doing at the Grand Canyon? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, sure. Happy to. Okay. So, so here's what I'll do. I will say a little more about what I was saying and then let you, because I'm not sure I'm totally tied in with what you were suggesting about the difference, but I'll let you see if I can clarify what I was saying and then you can see and think about it and let it kind of roll around and some other time we could talk more about it. Our thoughts have, con- our thoughts have content. You know, we think about something and it's a thought happens. But the process of thinking is separate from the content of thought. The mind thinks. What it thinks about varies according to the time, the place, the person, and their background, the conditions, and so forth. It is infinitely varied, the content of our thoughts. But the fact that we think is something that is universal among human beings. So that's the difference. We realize there's a difference between the content, the object of our thoughts, and the thinking process itself. And more and more as we practice, we begin to identify, oh, thinking process is happening. How many times, every single time we practice with mindfulness, we say the same guideline, pull out from the content, the story the, uh, of it, and just notice the, cl- the, the thought flowing by, the shape of it flowing by like a cloud in the sky. So those two things, it's, it's a real eye-opener when we realize, wait, you know, there's a difference between thinking, which the mind is going to do, and getting caught up in the story. So that's... Right. But that is not what we experience. It may right. be what we actually imagine about them because of whatever has gone on in right. our mind, right. David, background, whatever. We bring this to it, and many times when we get in that situation, we experience the present, the present. We're not able to experience them because we relate to the image. There we go. Beautiful. You are talking about mindfulness right there. This is the heart of our mindfulness practice. We begin to recognize, hey, I've got all these ideas, opinions, images, imaginations about what this is going to be, what they are, what it's going to be like. But when we come to the reality of, first of all, things are never even as we think they're going to be, but we begin to realize, hey, wait a minute, my thoughts, my opinions, my ideas have really shaped what I think my experience should be. And if we are mindful, we begin to pull out and recognize that. If we're not mindful, in fact, our ideas about it can shape our experience in a big way that has has little to do with the actual reality of what's going on. You talk to five different people about something, and each can speak in terms of what their thoughts about it were, their conditioning, and so forth. That's a beautiful, a beautiful observation. Thank you. So we have just a few moments now. Um, Mary Lou. Oh. Uh, please, Mary Lou.
stop by to see how things are going. And I thought he looked professional. 